Well, hello, everybody. My name is Bruce Korf. I'm a medical geneticist in the Department of Genetics at University of Alabama at Birmingham. It's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to participate in this conference. And I'll be focusing for this next 45 minutes or so on some of the educational challenges that we face as genetics and genomics are integrated into the day-to-day -day practice of medicine. These are my disclosures, neither of which is relevant to any of the things that I'll be talking about today. I'm going to begin with a quote that is more or less familiar, probably at least in general terms. I won't read the whole thing, but fundamentally what it says is that there's substantial concern about whether healthcare professionals are prepared to integrate genetics, and I would add genomics, into day-to-day -day clinical care. Most people who are practicing medicine, whether as physicians, nurses, physician assistants, or any other context, were trained probably before the human genome sequence was known, and whatever they may have learned about genetics and anything they might have learned about genomics, uh, if they remember it, is already probably out of date. It's a moving target even for individuals who are in the field to keep up with. And so there has been concern that as the opportunities to integrate genetics and genomics rapidly are increasing, that the degree of preparedness of health professionals to actually use this on a routine basis is not keeping pace. Now, with that being said, I'm going to begin, and as you'll see, end as well, on what I would deem to be an optimistic note, which is that in spite of the fact that I think it's true that clinicians are largely unprepared, in fact, I think things will work out. Um, and my evidence for that isn't so much from the area of genomics as much as it is from other areas of medicine. And I think there are plenty of, of previous experiences where new technologies have been introduced that at the time when they were introduced, clinicians also were unprepared, but somehow are managing to use those. And a very good example would be imaging, especially, for example, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, part of my practice involves seeing patients where imaging is a very common thing to do. And I order MRI scans on my patients um, prob practically um, every day. And I'm quite comfortable knowing when to order the test and knowing how to interpret the results. But if you were to ask me how does MRI work in terms of the physics, I would be pretty much helpless to answer that question. I probably could give you a very vague hand-waving um, kind of statement. It would probably be largely wrong. But the truth is it doesn't really affect my ability to know when to use this and how to interpret the results. And I would take the position that very much the same is going to be happening in the area of genetics and genomics. There will need to be a cadre of professionals who indeed do understand the nuts and bolts in quite substantial detail, but the majority of health providers will need to have a working knowledge and competency in using this information, but not necessarily a detailed sort of under the hood familiarity. So it's a point I'll return to at the end, but I think it's a really important overall theme for this talk. Let me give you a brief case history, actually, that occurred in our clinic to illustrate some of the challenges that clinicians currently face. So you're looking at a family tree for a child, and the arrow points to the 18-month-old boy, who was seen by an endocrinologist. Actually, the presenting problem was chronic diarrhea, diarrhea that had been present for a few weeks and didn't seem to be getting better. And the reason an endocrinologist was asked to see the child is there is a family history. The darkened symbols represent individuals who were phenotypically affected with multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1, a well-established clinical diagnosis in this family. And you can see the various tumors that individuals with this condition are at risk for, and they 
arguably include some that could potentially present with chronic diarrhea, probably not very often at this, at this young age, but nonetheless, at least it was a possibility. Well, recognizing that risk based on family history, a genetic test was sent by the endocrinologist. And this is a diagram copied more or less from the report. What was found was a so-called variant of uncertain significance that somehow the laboratory placed smack between pathogenic and benign. So some variants will have very clear pathogenic effects that have a profound effect on the gene and maybe have been reported before and proven to be pathogenic and others represent benign variants that are just slight differences in base sequence that have no phenotypic consequence. Well, this one was kind of placed right between those two. And generally when a variant of unknown significance is found, the conclusion is what the term implies, that we aren't sure what this means and therefore it shouldn't be used as a basis for clinical decision making. However, somehow it got interpreted in the medical record as this child has a mutation which indicates that he's affected with the condition. So that was the conclusion that was reached. Meanwhile, the mother was seen by a different endocrinologist, an adult endocrinologist, just based on her family history, who organized genetic testing separately from the child through the genetics clinic. And she was found to have a known pathogenic mutation. That is to say, a mutation that had been identified and other patients with this condition and was proven to have pathogenic significance. Turned out that that particular mutation was not present in the child and the variant of unknown significance that the child had was not present in the mother and therefore must have been inherited from the father. So it indicates that this child in fact did not inherit the mutation that was responsible for multiple endocrine neoplasia in the family, therefore would not be affected with that condition. It turns out, as you probably are aware, to be very, very difficult to erase a diagnosis from the medical record. I think it, to this day, probably is still in there in one way, shape, or form, but it's pretty clear that this child managed not to inherit the pathogenic mutation in the family and is not affected with diarrhea on this basis. It turned out, by the way, the diarrhea resolved over time and in the end turned out to be a gastroenteritis. So you can ask from the perspective of the clinician who ordered the test, what kinds of competencies would be necessary to provide care to this child with this family history and how, uh, how did the physician fare from that perspective? Well, you can say the first thing is you need to know that the family history does convey risk that this child would inherit a mutation for MEN1 and the risk would be 50% and the physician clearly did recognize that. You can say that the child would need, it would need to be recognized that the child might benefit from having a diagnosis. 18 months is a bit early to screen for MEN1, but it is something we do screen for in childhood. So generously, you could sort of put a check in that box. Then you could say, well, if the child is at risk of inheriting this and a diagnosis needs to be made, that MEN genetic testing is available, and clearly that was recognized, to then, when the result comes back, appreciate the significance of this variant of unknown significance. And well, that clearly was not demonstrated um, because this was interpreted by the clinician as a mutation uh, which would indicate the diagnosis, which was not the case. You might hope that a clinician would recognize that you would want to test an affected relative like the mother first to establish what actually the pathogenic mutation is, and that clearly wasn't done. Formulate an appropriate care plan. Well, that's a debatable point. Um, the child obviously in the end doesn't have this condition. Um, and probably this wouldn't have accounted for symptoms at that young age anyway. So you could ask the broad question, indeed, what are the necessary 
set of knowledge and skills required both to analyze, interpret, and then to utilize, utilize genomic information in day-to-day -day medical practice. I would argue that one needs to focus, first of all, on competencies, not knowledge. So the question isn't what do I think that clinicians should know, it's what do I think they should be able to do, since that really is the ultimate test of whether they're going to be able to use this information or not. And I think one of the mistakes we often make in genetics, actually, in teaching, is to go into a huge depth about the nuts and bolts of genomics, which is great fun and really interesting for those of us that do it, uh, but may not be appreciated entirely by students who are not going to be doing it, but may indeed be using it. And so I think we need to be very clear on what we do and don't expect clinicians to be able to do. I'll return to this point later, but we'll make it now that a lot of what's going to happen, I believe, is the development of point-of-care decision support tools that will guide clinicians in their use, so how much physicians need to be able to know how to do versus to be guided to do at the right moment um, remains a question. But I would not want to leave the impression that we are hoping to train a generation who are going to just know which key to press on a computer when told to do so. Um, and if you have any illusions that we don't think it's important for clinicians to at least have some understanding of the rationale for what they do, let the stern visage of Abraham Flexner set you straight that a health provider indeed should be able to explain why they're doing what they're doing, not only what and how. So what I want to do in the next few minutes is to analyze genetics and genomics as it relates to medical practice from three perspectives. These are diagnosis, prevention, and therapy, which I think are the three main arenas in which genomics is important. So you see here, no doubt very small, a blood smear from an individual with sickle cell anemia. And this is, well, in some ways you could argue this was the first genetic test. And it's a test that is, from a technical perspective, very straightforward to do. And the reason why is that 100% of people with sickle cell anemia have the same exact single base pair substitution mutation. So performing and interpreting that test really is straightforward. It doesn't mean providing care is straightforward, but if the issue is genetic testing, it's either the, the mutation is either present or not present in a homozygous form for an affected person or a heterozygous form for a carrier, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Contrast that with cystic fibrosis, a relatively common autosomal recessive condition where there are probably at this point thousands of different mutations that have been found. However, just a couple of dozen mutations roughly account for 99% or so of individuals who are affected. Actually, one particular mutation itself accounts for about two-thirds of all the mutations in this gene. So the testing is fairly straightforward in most cases but there are examples where one has to look a lot harder for a mutation and where there could be variants of unknown significance that might occasionally be found. So the testing is, again, fairly straightforward, but not always so. And then next on the spectrum is a disorder, which is really the focus of my personal interest in research, neurofibromatosis type 1, a condition associated with tumors along the course of peripheral nerves. The diagram to the upper left shows an example of the map of the gene with each of the markings below it or above it represent different mutations. Our lab here at UAB, which does testing, we found something over 3,000 distinct mutations in this gene in the course of the decade or so that we've been doing testing. We still just about every week find a previously undescribed mutation that we can prove is pathogenic. And so it's a very complicated test, and lots of things happen that are unexpected 
mutations are found that look like they should be pathogenic but aren't, or that look like they shouldn't be pathogenic but are. You need a lot of sophistication to interpret that test accurately. In recent years, genomic testing has become mainstream in the context of chromosomal analysis, probably familiar with cytogenetic studies that detect extra or missing chromosomal material. Probably the um, most famous of these and best known is doing a karyotype looking to see if there's an extra copy of chromosome 21 if Down syndrome is suspected. It's a very straightforward test to do and it's been possible to do for more than 50 years now. But in the past few years, this has moved largely from a cytological test to a molecular test through the advent of cytogenomic microarrays. And this has made a very significant improvement in our pickup rate in conditions such as autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability, where we've moved from maybe a 5% detection rate to close to a 20% detection rate is not 100%, so there's plenty that we miss, but nonetheless, a very substantial improvement over the historical rate of detection. And then in these past maybe three or so years, finally, the ability to actually sequence genomes to um, be able to do either an exome or a genome sequence to try to identify a mutation in an individual who is affected with some phenotype, which has the potential of sort of breaking this cycle that I illustrate here, the so-called diagnostic odyssey, where you try to make a differential diagnosis, order appropriate genetic tests, try to interpret them. And if that's not the right mutation, you keep going around in circles, each time spending a lot of money, causing a lot of frustration, not necessarily answering the question. And exome sequencing now is done on a routine basis, actually, uh, to try to identify mutations where either at a priori we don't have any idea of what the mutation might be, or there are too many candidate genes to test at once, and it becomes more cost effective to sequence the 20,000 plus genes comprising the exome, all the expressed sequences, rather than test one gene at a time. So big questions in terms of what do clinicians need to be able to do to interpret this. And I would make the point that, especially as we get into exome sequencing approaches, things get complicated very quickly. This is a screenshot from a paper published in Science Translational Medicine a couple of years ago, showing that Virtually everybody is a carrier for at least one and sometimes multiple different recessive conditions. And even on top of that, that many of the variants that they found in this particular study were annotated in the literature as being pathogenic, but in fact were not necessarily accurately determined to be pathogenic. So some of the so-called pathogenic mutations have turned out to be, in fact, non-pathogenic variants of unknown significance. And the literature is not always reliable on this point. Um, there are examples where mutations got reported sometimes decades ago and then kind of forgotten about. And as evidence further accumulated, it became clear they weren't pathogenic. But people didn't always go back and update the literature. And so it becomes a big issue in terms of accurately and correctly interpreting these and not taking a mutation report at face value. There's also the potential of incidental findings. I, I showed this um, painting um, to use the metaphor of if you saw somebody walking down the street with a flower pot about to fall on their head, would you call attention to that? And the equivalent in exome sequencing is the possibility of incidental findings, looking for one thing, like the cause of a let's say, a child with intellectual disabilities and discovering something totally unexpected, like a risk of breast and ovarian cancer due to a BRCA mutation. Well, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics issued a statement about this in 2013 and updated it 
just this past few months, recommending that 56 genes be scrutinized for mutations that would have major medical significance. All of these are actionable genes that, if a mutation is found, convey a high risk of a condition where there is a better medical outcome from early diagnosis. And the argument here is that you may not have been looking for that cancer-related mutation, but once you have found it, there is a responsibility to report it. Now, there is a, an opt-out option for patients where, for whatever reason, after pretest counseling, they've decided they don't want to know this. Um, so far as, I'm a, as I understand it from the community, and I can tell you it's been true in my own patients, uh, very few choose to opt out um, given the potential even of life-saving information about conditions that predispose to cancer or to cardiac arrhythmia. But anyway, the opt-out is, is at least offered as a possibility. But again, this requires a lot of sophistication on the part of the clinician to be able to explain this kind of thing to a patient about to undergo testing. And the danger is that as you look at the genome sequence and you think back to, well, what did you learn about genetics or genomics in, well, high school, college, medical school, nursing school, or whatever your postgraduate education was. And if there's one thing you remember, it's probably that the genetic code is a three-letter code. Three letters encode any particular amino acid. And it's easy to get lulled into asking yourself, well, just how hard could that be if it's just a three-letter code? And some people use the metaphor of the genome as the book of life. And if you were to stick with that metaphor and say, so what is an example of a book that uses three-letter words? This may come to mind. And you know, is, is it as simple as reading a Dr. Seuss book to interpret the genetic code? So my argument would be that no, it isn't. That if you do want to use a literary metaphor in genomics, this is a better book to be thinking about. Any of you who have tried to read or have read Ulysses realize that you could teach a first grader who's just learned to read to read Ulysses if you mean by that pronounce the words that are written on the paper. But the chances that individual would be able to understand the nuances, read between the lines, know the obscure references that are embedded in this text are pretty slim. It's hard enough for adults to do that. And reading the genome sequence, that you could read the amino acids for a gene easily enough, um, but looking at the nuances, reading between the lines, knowing what's pathogenic or not, is a much, much more complicated undertaking. And if you want to stretch a literary metaphor one more step, it is not difficult to reach a point where you pass through the looking glass and things you thought you knew don't turn out to be true. Mutations that look pathogenic aren't. Um, epigenetic changes occur. So there's a lot of nuance here that requires, in turn, a lot of sophistication. What about in the area of prevention? Well, geneticists have been involved in population scale prevention since the 1960s with the advent of newborn screening. And the theory here was that if you could make a diagnosis before the onset of symptoms based on identification of a analyte in blood, which indicates a condition like PKU, phenylketonuria, due to the inability to break down phenylalanine, that you could institute treatment that takes the form of dietary manipulation and avoid a devastating outcome. And if you wait for symptoms to occur, it's too late. So the idea was to test right in the newborn period and then institute treatment promptly if a abnormal screen occurs and, and to confirm the diagnosis. What's shown at the bottom is the diagram of tandem mass spectrometry. The original test, which is illustrated at the very top, was a bacterial inhibition assay, but now blood is injected into a tandem mass spectrometer and a reading is then done that can look potentially for dozens of abnormal analytes, vastly expanding the scope of newborn screening. However, you know, if you're in the 
shoes of the pediatrician who gets a call Friday at 4.30 from the state lab that says there was an abnormal screen, what do you do? And the chances are most pediatricians, and it will be a pediatrician because these are newborns, most pediatricians, if they learned about some of the metabolic disorders, have had very limited experience with them, and it may have been years since they took care of a child with some of the more obscure conditions. So how would one expect them to know what to do in that late afternoon call? American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics has put together a set of so-called ACT sheets, which are an example is shown on this slide, that consists of a very brief kind of step-by-step, -step. here are the immediate things to do to provide appropriate care for that child. And it's assumed that for some of these obscure disorders, it's going to be necessary to engage the assistance of an expert in metabolic disease. But here are the things to think about before you get that person on the phone to deal with the most immediate and emergent kinds of issues. And you can see there's also a kind of flow chart provided. And I think this kind of model will apply to many areas of genetics and genomics. We don't necessarily assume that all health providers will be able to carry all the interpretation and management issues on their own shoulders. You would expect that they will rely on colleagues for assistance and backup, but to put a very succinct point of care decision support tool at their disposal to at least help them to know what's the next step and what are the things going forward that they need to be watching for? Well, there's been a lot of interest in risk assessment based on genomics, especially through the results of genome-wide association studies. And it spawned a set of companies that have been offering direct-to-consumer testing. The idea is you basically give them a credit card number, send a sample, often a sample of spit, they analyze it for mostly about a million single nucleotide polymorphisms and then provide a web-based interpretation. Not all of these companies still are in this field. There's been a little bit of natural selection here. And the one major one left standing is temporarily at least or currently involved in a debate with the FDA to get approval to actually um, include some of the medical interpretations. So it's generated a lot of anxiety in the medical community because patients can access this testing without the intervention of a clinician to, to do this all on their own. And the quality, at least in my view, of, of a lot of the data reported back in terms of educational is quite good. However, the quality of the risk assessments may be um, a very different matter um, based on very limited data sets. And there's been concern about whether patients might inaccurately interpret some of what they get back from this, either thinking they're at higher or potentially lower risk than they really are. Also realizing that the genomic contribution to risk for many of the common conditions, like type 2 diabetes or hypertension, uh, may be modest, and so you may be chipping away at the edges of risk. Uh, so anyway, it's generated a lot of concern. I would make the argument that this may be an example of a so-called disruptive technology. This is a diagram I've modified from a book uh, by Clay Christensen, who has formulated this idea. Disruptive technology is one that, when it's introduced, is nowhere close to the power of whatever the mainstream technology is. And a good example is the introduction of personal computers in the late 1970s at a time when computers filled the room. And you couldn't run a business off a personal computer back in those days. You could play games on them, which is probably what a lot of people did. Um, and so they were dismissed at first. But over time, the quality gets better and better, as indicated by the green line. And what starts off as kind of a toy evolves into a very serious tool. And in the case of the personal computer, some of the companies that were marketing mainframe computers are no longer in business, in fact, got swallowed up by some of the personal computer companies. As applied to risk assessment in genetics, the current paradigm of a physician or genetic counselor working one-on-one -on -one with a patient, one gene at a time, shown by the red line, may get better and better in an incremental way. But 
it is possible, and of course I can't know that this is true, that the consumer-driven testing, which may be kind of recreational more than medical right now, as the data sets get better, may eventually surpass the one gene at a time approach. And one thing is for sure, and that is if we're going to be doing genome scale testing, the one gene at a time approach to counseling is just not going to be sustainable. So we are going to need to be looking somewhere for new counseling models, whether this particular one is the right one, I guess is a point that many will want to debate. What about in the area of therapeutics? So one of the poster cases for genome-informed therapeutics is imatinib, which was developed based on knowledge of the bcr able translocation that occurs in chronic myelogenous leukemia that creates a fusion gene in a novel peptide. And it was possible to develop this drug that blocks an ATP binding site and effectively turns off that pathway and has made a big difference in the treatment of chronic myelogenous leukemia and some other forms of cancer as well. This notion of targeting therapies based on understanding of molecular mechanisms certainly has been a, a major area of interest, although you could make the argument that to actually use a matinib as opposed to developing a matinib, it wasn't really necessary to know genetics. You had to know a lot of genetics to develop it. You don't need to know it on a moment-to-moment -moment, moment basis to use it so much. Here, I realize small are some examples of mutation tests, um, either for um, the HER2 new amplification in breast cancer or um, a RAF mutation that occurs in melanoma and can be used as a basis for deciding which particular treatment is likely to be most effective for a particular cancer. The diagram at the right shows the ability to do cancer genome analysis, which is being done on an increasingly wide basis to try to get to the bottom of particular cancers, what the various catalog of genetic changes is that drives that cancer and to target therapy according to the specific fingerprint or profile of the tumor. So another area where genomics has really moved to center stage. And then pharmacogenetics, where this is the pathway both for activity and excretion of warfarin, commonly used blood thinner, where two polymorphisms, one involved in its target, Vcore C1, and one involved in its excretion, are both subject to genetic modification by particular common mutations in the population. And using these as a basis for deciding the exact dosage of warfarin is pretty well established to speed up the achievement of a therapeutic dosage that is not to give too much, which causes a risk of hemorrhage, nor too little, which causes a risk of blood clotting. What's debated is not whether this is clinically valid, but whether it's clinically useful. Can you get the testing in a timely basis? And is it cost effective? Here I would argue that how much physicians and others who prescribe medications need to know except in general terms about pharmacogenetics is limited. I don't think physicians are going to be sitting there with a calculator recalculating warfarin dosage each time a patient goes on treatment. But one could argue, as this is demonstrated to be clinically useful, that the electronic prescribing systems should integrate the results of this testing into the prescribing information. And so when you're going to put a patient on medication, it should flag, well, this is somebody you need to adjust the dose from whatever the standard starting dose is to something else because they're at risk of hemorrhage, for example. But with all of this now, having made some comments about diagnosis, population um, screening and prevention, and therapy, how do we approach some of the educational challenges? First, from the professional genetics point of view, first of all, you should know that there is such a thing as a professional geneticist, does generally a two-year residency in genetics, typically following some kind of residency in an ACGME accredited program 
in areas like pediatrics or adult medicine, for example. Uh, but now, on three occasions, the genetics community has held meetings at the Banbury Conference Center near Cold Spring Harbor, the first in 2004 to talk about how to increase numbers of trainees. At that time, the big issue was getting more people with adult training into genetics. The second occurring in 2006 focused on what exactly is a medical geneticist and what is the scope of practice in the current era. And the third that occurred just a few months ago uh, looked at genetics training in the genomic era. How do we keep clinicians up to speed when they train in an era where nobody was sequencing genomes, but they are now. If I were to summarize a lot of this into one slide, it's the notion of establishing a kind of vector of competency. Uh, we need to do a better job of marketing genetics and genomics and making sure that students are aware that there are career opportunities there and being sure that students who matriculate into medical school at least have some basic familiarity with genetics and genomics that needs to be integrated into medical education and residency and over time into their CME and especially maintenance of certification activities, which provides a great opportunity to reach individuals who are currently out in practice. Indeed, the importance of genetics and genomics and medical education was highlighted a few years ago <coughs> by a study, or really a project undertaken by Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Association of American Medical Colleges. It was a committee that I served on. And they were concerned about the basic science background that undergraduates were getting before they matriculated in medical school, and then subsequently um, the training that they actually got in medical school. This is the competency that was identified for genetics. Everybody came to this meeting with laundry list of things they thought students should be able to do or to know. And everybody was equally disappointed that their discipline got only a few lines or paragraphs. So I guess it was, if you measure success by everybody's equally unhappy, it achieved that. But in fact, I think it maintained a very good focus on what's really important. And in this case, this covers a lot of territory. This is the competency in genetics. Now I'll say this slightly predated some of the genomic testing now being done. So in that sense, it may be out of date. But they also asked the question, you know, where, for example, medical school admission very commonly requires knowledge of things like organic chemistry and calculus, might it be more important to include genetics on the prerequisites? And how often do you actually use calculus in day-to-day -day medical practice as opposed to genetics? So um, there have been some suggested changes in both pre-medical and medical curricula as a result of this. More recently, the National Human Genome Research Institute has been funding a group called the Inner Society Coordinating Committee, the ISCC. And the theory there was that a lot of the postgraduate training is under the aegis of professional societies. And they thought by bringing the professional societies together, they might be able to get synergy in terms of including genetics and genomics in the curriculum, both for residency training and maintenance and certification. So I chaired a working group on competencies in that process. And we identified six areas called um, observable um, professional activities um, entrustable professional activities, rather, um, EPAs um, that basically say, what do you expect a clinician, in this case a physician, to be able to do? Like to elicit, document, and act on relevant family history or utilize genomic testing to guide patient management. So there were six of those. Each of them then was defined in terms of a set of competencies that were written according to the ACGME six competencies model that you're probably familiar with. And I won't go into detail about these, except to refer you to the paper on this in genetics and medicine. We didn't expect that 
a one size fits all approach would work. So there was no expectation that the exact competencies put forth in that document would, without modification, be useful probably for any clinician, um, whether a generalist or a specialist. But we thought this could provide a starting point. So if a cardiology group wanted to formulate the competencies relevant to a cardiologist, that this would be a jumping off point to do that. And the same could apply to an oncologist or a gastroenterologist. In any case, these have been published now and refer you to the article uh, to get more detail about those. The genetics community has done the same, met about three years ago to formulate competencies in medical genetics. I won't show you all of these. They were published in Genetics and Medicine and can be found on the acmg.net website. But these are, of course, focused not on the generalist clinician, but on the medical geneticist professional, uh, where obviously a much higher level of competency is expected. How do we get more people to recognize the opportunities for genetics training and to go into the field? Well, one of the more successful, I think, um, approaches, successful at least in terms of buy-in. I can't yet say whether it's successful in terms of increasing the number, <coughs> excuse me, of trainees, has been the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics Foundation Summer Scholars Program, where students can apply um, in their first year of medical school to spend the summer doing a genetic genomic project and observing usually in clinic or in laboratory settings. And now several dozen students over the past, I guess this is the fourth year it's been done, have taken place, uh, taken part rather in this, and have had a firsthand exposure. Now, you know, whether this will entice some to actually stay in the field and seek training uh, or provide more sensitivity about the issues in genetics and genomics remains to be seen. But I think it's been a good program in terms of getting at least a buzz in the medical school class about the opportunities here. And for sure, there are new educational paradigms that we could be using and probably should be using. Show here the possibility of so-called massive open online courses. Um, the Khan Academy sort of micro courses is an, is an interesting model that might be applied. This is an iBook that we put together for a course. It's really more research than clinically oriented, but here at UAB, um, where we can deliver lecture content and other materials, quizzes and so forth into that kind of a format. Or things like iTunes University and other similar kinds of um, approaches for distance learning. So all of these things are available to begin to experiment with paradigms that are above and beyond the traditional lecture approach that most clinicians are most familiar with. So I'm going to end on a few speculations about the future. Um, the first is you often hear it said that a day will come when everybody will have their genome sequenced. And the question that I'll ask is, if so, when would you do it in the course of a person's lifetime? Not when will we be doing it on a wide scale, but when in a person's life would you do it? And second, where would the information live? So you can actually sequence a fetal genome from a blood sample taken from the mother where a very small amount of fetal DNA kind of leaches into the mother's blood doesn't last very long there, but at any one time, there will be some. And you can actually use that as a source of DNA to sequence. And in principle, you can sequence a fetal genome even before birth. Now, whether it's a good idea to do that is a different matter. And the same could be applied to newborn screening, where the National Human Genome Research Institute now is funding a set of studies looking at the efficacy of, of newborn screening by genetic diagnosis. Um, the advantage to either of these is you get a very early diagnosis, and that means if there is an intervention, it can be applied reasonably promptly. On the other hand, there will be a lot of issues as to whether you can obtain proper informed consent, which obviously you can't in the newborn, um, 
we seem to deal with that in things like newborn screening and will we for genomic sequencing, I guess is the question. You can also just wait a little while and do it in childhood, but some of the same issues in terms of consent and what do you do if you're discovering adult onset disorder arise. Or you can wait till adulthood when you can give consent, but maybe it's too late to intervene in some way that might have been beneficial. So there are arguments on both sides there. And then if you did it, you could ask, so where would the data live? So one possibility is in the electronic health record. It's a daunting possibility to many because of the storage requirements that it entails. And it is limited by the fact that it's pretty hard to get medical records sent from one hospital to another in the conventional form. Imagine trying to do it for genomic information and very few people live their lives affiliated with just a single medical center um, most times. These days, somebody might be born in one hospital, get care as a child in another, and in an adult as another, and also people move around. And what happens if you're traveling the day something happens that your genome sequence could have been used before? Will you have access to it? You can, and some do, put their genome sequence on personal devices. It is possible to do that. Um, you still have to remember to bring it with you and not break it or lose it, but it is a potentially powerful approach. And finally, my favorite is the cell nucleus seems to be, the, so far anyway, the most efficient place ever devised to um, store genomic information. And it may evolve to a point where it'll be cheaper to resequence a genome every time you want to use it rather than bother storing the information in the human clinical roots. So it's possible that sequencing will come down enough in price that it'll be essentially free and cheaper to do again than to bother storing all the genomic information. Hard to know, and this has been and will continue to be a moving target technologically for some time. You could ask the question, with all of this, when are clinicians really likely to be using this on a routine basis? And the screenshot I'm showing you is from iTunes, not from a medical source. And that, that really is fundament, uh, fundamentally my argument, that clinicians will use this routinely the day somebody comes up with a medical record system as powerful and intuitive and easy and fun to use as iTunes. If you think back 15 or so years, People were getting music downloaded onto MP3 players, often illegally, because there just was no practically legal way to do it. It was so convenient. Um, and I don't think I've necessarily minded paying a small amount per song they download. They just needed a way to do it that was efficient and intuitive and fun. And that's what this was. And there are others in that landscape now. But the point is, that's the kind of breakthrough that was required. And I think very much the same is true in electronic medical records. Uh, most clinicians I know find them a bit frustrating uh, much of the time because they aren't designed to capture this kind of information. The day somebody integrates genomic information with the same clarity and simplicity, in spite of the complexities which are behind the scenes as iTunes, that's the day when I think we'll be seeing much more widespread use. So what needs to happen? I guess I'll make four final points. One, we're a long way from having a fully annotated genome. It's in will be, and for a while, I'm sure still will be, lots of variants of unknown significance. But that shouldn't discourage its use. It just means that you've got to partner with a really sophisticated geneticist in the lab or even in the clinic to accurately interpret what's found. Um, the second, I think we're going to see more and more use of point of care decision support tools, such as I mentioned, pharmacogenetics. Collaboration and partnerships among specialties will be absolutely necessary. And new counseling paradigms, whether the direct-to-consumer one takes off or others, uh, we, we aren't going to be able to, to sustain counseling one gene at a time when we're testing one genome at a time. So with that, I'll end with a quote that I find now is being used more and more. So maybe it's a little trite, but I think it applies really well here. 
Um, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. I don't know exactly when or how a lot of these things will unfold, uh, but what makes this such an exciting time, in genetics especially, and in medicine in general, is this opportunity to write the book on how genetics and genomics will be integrated into medical practice. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I know that there are some questions, and I'll um, now open the site and um, begin to take a look at those. Oh, I see it here. The, the first question says, developing medicines and treatments specific to individual genetic makeups to improve effectiveness is one thing, but is it also possible to use genetic makeup to cull a population of the imperfections and defects and thus result in a more perfect society with the desired genetic makeup? Thoughts on the possibility and how to prevent it. Um, society does so well. I guess my answer there is that, you know, the sort of eugenic possibilities and what many would view as the kind of misuse of genomics to select for traits that somebody decides might be desirable. Honestly, I think we're a very, very long way from that. I actually am a bit of a skeptic, and I didn't quite say it this way, but I am, about our ability even to predict major common disorders, you know, type 2 diabetes, for example. Um, people have been trying to get at that for quite some while, and I, my concern is that the genomic sort of makeup that predicts that may be so complicated and individual as to defy even that being able to um, be done. So, you know, the kind of things people talk about, like athletic performance and intelligence and other kind of common traits, hair color, eye color, whatever you like, they're multifactorial, they involve the simultaneous effects of multiple genes. I frankly think it's, it's really going to be difficult to um, select those to a degree that will really sort of achieve the kind of eugenic um, sort of fears that many people have. So I tend to worry about it less than um, how it's sometimes described. Right. Another question, the human is an imperfect entity subject to more imperfections from environmental influences, can this technology be used to create the perfect human? Well, I think we've just answered that because the answer is no. I'm not even sure what would define uh, the perfect human. So I'll move on. Um, an individual finds that they're predisposed to pancreatic cancer. And how, how has it helped them aside from being depressed? So, you know, I won't try to tackle a particular individual um, condition in, in a public talk of this kind, but I will say that the paradigm of um, genetic testing for cancer risk is increasingly well established. Um, the, the one where it's probably best established, or the ones, would be breast, ovarian, and colon cancer, where it's really clear that if you find you're a genetic risk, there are interventions. Now, you know, one of them would be mastectomy or um, surveillance, and this would apply to colon cancer as well. And there's absolutely no doubt that you can improve outcomes uh, with this knowledge. It becomes a lot tougher with some cancers, pancreatic cancer, actually ovarian cancer arguably is in this category too. What makes both of them so difficult is that they, the, the cancers can kind of hide um, in tissues deep inside the body until they get pretty far advanced and then can be hard to treat. Uh, there are surveillance approaches that exist, including for pancreatic cancer. And, you know, I guess one usually gets testing done because of family history. And in that case, there's already concern. And, you know, I'm sure it, it is a, a tough thing for people to deal with that on the one hand. Um, but increasingly, there are interventions that allow early diagnosis and promise better outcomes, um, especially for things like breast, ovarian, and colon cancer. But pancreatic cancer is subject to surveillance as well. 
Next question, uh, with the affordable health care law in effect, could we see a future, there being a requirement that everybody needs to submit to genomic identification, um, and maybe it would increase the efficacy for treatment and make medications more selective. Um, so, you know, I do think what you're going to find, I, I don't think we're at a point anywhere close to a point where everybody's going to be required to have their genome sequenced. Um, debatable whether we'll ever reach a point where that'll become routine, but you know, I've kind of given you at least a little bit of discussion of that. However, I think one thing you will see, and actually already do see in some cases, is that if there's, let's say, a very expensive and probably toxic chemotherapy being proposed to use, and there's a genetic test that will predict whether you will or won't respond to it, you could argue that it would be irresponsible to put somebody on a medication if you could predict in advance that they won't respond to it, especially if it's a toxic one or a very expensive one. And there already are instances where drugs will only be used if the genetic test indicates that you're the kind of person who will respond. I don't see that as discriminatory. I see that as just logical um, use of technology because it would be kind of um, wasteful and foolhardy even to use a medication that's guaranteed to fail if you could figure that out in advance and then select one that has a better chance of working. And the last question I see just says there's a need for population and general education. That's a good point. I've been focusing on professional education, but there's a lot of need for public education here as well, part of, partly to dispel some of the myths, some of which we've been talking about in the last few minutes, partly so people can make better informed decisions for their health care based on what I predict will be the increased use of genetics and genomics in day-to-day -day medical practice. So this needs to be integrated into general education as well as professional education. So that appears to be the last question. So at this point, um, I thank you very much for your attention and hope that this was helpful. Thank you.